a lot of people buy from us. Well, and we have a lot of pro writers even that go with us just because we're there. And they they see us, they meet us, and they're like, wow, this is a nice rig you have. You guys must be banking, you know? And it's like, nope, this is actually our house. And we sold everything to do this. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm totally buying from you. Welcome to the RV Entrepreneur Podcast, the weekly show for nomads, work campers, RVers, and entrepreneurs looking to earn a living or build a business while enjoying the RV lifestyle. This week's host is Rose Willard. Let's settle in and enjoy the RV Entrepreneur Podcast brought to you by RV Life. Welcome to another episode of the RV Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm your host this week, Rose Willard, and I am so excited to dive into my conversation today with Robert and Tasha Lackey because they're right in the heart of their exhilarating and dynamic phase of their business, the growth phase. Robert and Tasha are full-time RVers along with two of their four kids that chose the nomadic lifestyle, not for leisure, but as a strategic move to grow their business, Bison a motorcycle racing gear business, which thrives by being present at numerous motorcycle racetracks in countless states. They have a lot going on, but they're going to provide valuable behind the scenes insights of running a mobile business. In this episode, we'll discuss the challenges they face, as well as how they manage inventory and shipping of their products from the road. We dive into scaling their business, navigating the legal intricacies of selling products across different states tax considerations, as well as promoting their brand at racetracks. The lackeys will also share the importance of building a community and culture around bison, as well as the lessons learned and invaluable advice for fellow entrepreneurs considering RV life. We'll also discuss what a typical day looks like for them on the road, balancing work, life, and homeschooling. So join us as we explore the unconventional path they've chosen and their unique way of growing a business on the road. Right after this short message about how you can make the most of your RV life. Your RV adventures are worth sharing. With an RV life profile, you can connect with a community of RV enthusiasts, engage in meaningful conversations, and inspire others on their journey. It's not just about where you go. It's about the memories you make and the people you meet along the way. Start sharing your unique RV experiences at rvlife.com. Hey, Robert and Tasha. I am so glad you're here today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. You are welcome. My pleasure. I'm excited to chat with you both today because we share similar reset stories and also because you're kind of different from most full-time RVers out there and that you travel to grow your motorcycle racing gear business, which is a physical product that you sell from your RV. So I have a lot of questions about all this, but first, can you briefly tell us a little bit about who you guys are, what you're doing, and what your RV life looks now? And it can be a short version if you like. Yeah. So basically, uh, Tasha and I, we've been married a long time, about almost 20 years, I think. <laughs> and uh, we'll get into all that later. But essentially, right now, we've been in our RV for about four years. We're just running all over the country, like you said, trying to grow our business. And, mm -hmm. uh, but also at the same time, trying to give our kids like an on site education, you know, and, and just life is like a vacation sometimes. And then other times it's like a nightmare, but we're just taking it day by day and uh, trying to enjoy every minute of it. So right now we're posted up in Kansas. We've been to all 48 states, but Kansas is home to both of our families. So that's where we're at right now. And we're usually here through the holidays. That's kind of our reset and break period. So that's what we're doing now. Perfect. Yeah, that's what we did too around this time. We were back east and settling down for yep. a bit before heading back out. So that works. So when you first got into this RV life, had you ever RV'd before? Nope, never. No, no. <laughs> nope. Yeah, yeah we no. went in both feet. Yeah, it's actually crazy. I think I wrote a blog about it on our website, but from the time that we had the idea to RV to the time that we actually started RVing and we were full time, it was less than six weeks. Oh my yeah. goodness. That is <laughs> yeah. very quick. <laughs> what were we thinking, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, we definitely didn't. I mean, we planned, but in a very short period of time. So mm -hmm. continues to be the theme. 
So how did this idea of moving into an RV to grow your business first begin? (laughs) So like Tasha said, it happened very quickly. Her and I were both working full time, obviously, you know, in, in office jobs, basically. I was service manager for car dealerships and I'd been in the auto industry for like 20 years. Tasha was VP of finance for a marketing agency in Oklahoma City. And we were both making great money and we loved our jobs. And then two things happened. One was we started talking about the lack of like us time. You know, we were making good money, but we were working our butts off and we just had a bunch of stuff and we didn't have a lot of experiences. Right. So our youngest daughter, Edith, you know, she'd never really been on a vacation. We'd never taken her and done anything. And there she was what, six years old, you know, and at the time and we're like, man, she's six. And we've never t- really taken her anywhere. And then Carter at the time, he was uh, 12. and it was like, same deal. He, we'd taken him a couple places, but we're like, these kids don't get experiences, man. It'd be cool if we could do something a little bit different. And we kind of had a, uh, like a catalyst moment, I call it, where Tasha and I went out of town for Memorial Day weekend. And um, we tried to cram everything into three days because I had Monday off. And I still got basically, you know, just I, my, well, yeah. my employer beat me up about it. You know, I, it actually wrote me up because I took Memorial Day off for her birthday, no less. And I was so frustrated. I said, you know what? We shouldn't live like this. Like this is our jobs are are running us, not vice versa. And then right after that conversation, both of our situations with work kind of hit speed bumps. And Tasha especially was very frustrated with her situation. And one night we were sitting in bed and we were both kind of, she was crying and I was trying to console her, but I was upset too. And I said, you know what, because we'd already been talking about bison and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but bison at that point, we'd had it for a year and it was a side hustle. And we'll talk about how that started and everything, I'm sure. But we had talked about, shoot, one of us should just do bison full time or we're going to have to hire somebody. (laughs) And uh, so with that conversation preceding all this, I said, you know what, we could both just quit, get like an RV or something and just travel and Airbnb the house, sell it. I don't know, but we could just do bison full time. And she just like the tap work shut off and she was like, you know what? Yeah, we should probably, we should do that. And I was like, okay. We chatted for a few more minutes, went to bed. And then we woke up in the morning and it was kind of like, so that conversation last night, are we actually, are we going to do that? And we're like, yeah, we should do it. And boom, it just like things started escalating quickly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We hurried up and bought, you know, our RV and everything while we both still had full-time jobs and income and kind of re reorganized our vehicle situation, sold a sold an expensive car we had and bought a cheap car we had. So we are both like really big picture people, you know, and we both get crazy ideas, but they never happen at the same time. And so like, you know, I'll be like, hey, we should buy this house. And we'll all be like, no, not right now, you know, and, or vice versa. He'll be like, let's buy this motorcycle it's usually a motorcycle <laughs> and uh and i'll be like no not right now and with the rv thing it just aligned like we both were just like yes which is good that we normally offset each other because otherwise we do a lot of crazy stuff but hmm. yeah that one just aligned perfectly and that was our that was our catalyst that's awesome yeah you guys needed a reset you know something to really shake things up a bit and you did it fast rip that band-aid off Sometimes that works really well. It sounds like it's working for you guys. And you downsized, right? You got rid of a lot of your stuff, cut some expenses, got the RV. What kind of RV did you guys decide on? So we did a whole bunch of research, of course, uh, in a short period of time. He did. I didn't. Yeah. (laughs) So I've always liked RVs. I mean, when I was three years old, I used to go to my grandma's house to stay and she had like cardboard boxes. She baked cakes and stuff. So I would take the boxes and draw them like an RV, like they'd look like a motorhome. And then I'd cut windows out and stuff and I was sleeping them. And uh, so I was like, ah, it's my, it's my RV. So like, literally, I've always wanted to do this. My dad always wanted to do it too. And anyway, so I was excited about the research of the RVs and I always kind of knew a little bit about them. But anyway, we started with like a class C based on our budget. We thought we had to buy like a new RV, like a newish RV. And with that in mind, class C's were kind of like what we were looking at. And I'm like, I just don't know if this is going to do it, like room space wise and capacity, you know, towing and all that. And so we almost bought a class C, like we did the rookie thing. 
no offense to anybody. We went to Camping World, looked at a Class C, and was like, yep, this is the one. And looking back, we're like, oh, I'm like, we dodged a bullet on that one. So we came home that night, and uh, actually, Camping World, just they just didn't want to take our deposit. I was like, yeah, this is the one we want. And I was like, we'll give you a deposit. And they were just like hem-hawing around, and we ended up leaving. And it's like, everything happens for a reason. Man, that was like, literally, I'm oh. like, why did they not want our money? Yeah, you lucked. Yeah. Lucked out. <laughs> yeah, we lucked. So anyway. Got home that night. She had passed out, and something told me just like look more, look fell more. Asleep is not more appropriate term. Yeah, you fell asleep, didn't okay. pass out. There's a difference, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I pulled up my phone and I found Thor Outlaws, which is a toy hauler because we looked at toy hauler like fifth wheels that we could you know buy a dually, put the fifth wheel, and then the toy hauler has the garage in the back for the the office stuff or the inventory for our company, of course, and then the motorcycles for play. Anyway, I, I didn't know that they made a class A toy hauler. And I found the outlaw. The reason a fifth wheel doesn't work for us is because we move so much. You know, just the teardown and the setup of a fifth wheel is not feasible. So uh, anyway, found the outlaw. And basically, we didn't look at an outlaw. I watched all the videos, read all the specs, everything. We didn't look at one. But I found one in Texas. We were in Oklahoma City at the time. So I was like, all right, that's right down I-35. And it was like 110000 or whatever. And then I found one in Florida that was substantially cheaper. And... I called them the next day and I, I woke Tasha up the next morning. I'm like, look, I found an RV and I send her all these links. And she's like, wow, that's great. Okay. But I called the Florida dealership and I said, listen, I, there's one in Texas I can look at or we can negotiate over the phone. They negotiated with me, got figured out in a couple of hours. And then I called her and like, we had a plane ticket to go. Like sight unseen, hadn't looked at any of these RVs in person. And we were just like, we were so excited, but I'm like, we just got to be prepared to cut bait and fly back home. Like we can't get so excited that we're going to pick this thing up and come back. But ended up, we got to Fort Myers, Florida, and it was um, it was everything that we hoped it would be. It was perfect. And uh, we still love that thing. We still got it. It's for sale, by the way. Somebody should buy it. 2014 Thor Outlaw. But <laughs> oh, we'll nice. talk about that later. So we yeah. loved that RV. We were in it for four years. So, Oh, that's awesome. And I can't wait to get into your business here. All sorts of questions. But real quick, as we're all entrepreneurs here, what does being an entrepreneur mean to you guys? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, we actually talked a little bit about this. And we both have kind of different meanings there, I think. For me personally, entrepreneurship is more about building something, like building something that has a purpose, you know? Whether the purpose is, you know, financial freedom or contributing to a community or whatever the purpose may be, it's about a purpose for me. I like, I'm very purpose driven. I think Rob had a little bit different take on that one. Yeah. As per usual, we offset each other. So <laughs> hers was very much like, you know, creating something meaningful with value. And, and while I do understand that and I get it, for me, it's more like freedom and flexibility. So we're kind of, opposite ends of the spectrum. I love the ability to, like today, we woke up, and we're like, do we want to stay in the RV and work? Or do we want to go into the office and work, you know, and like, let's just stay here. And do I want to sit at this table? Or do I want to sit over there in that chair or go lay in bed and work? Like, I think that's cool. And then the financial freedom to Tasha's point, it's like, you know, yeah, you can kind of do what you want every day. That being said, you can't ever shut it off. So <laughs> yeah, I agree. But those are all great reasons. Yeah. That's why I think, I mean, they're all reasons that we we tend to do this and some way heavily for people more than others. But um, mm -hmm. I, like you said, the flexibility, the freedom, the the purpose, that's very, very important. So that's awesome. You guys, were you always entrepreneurial or um, like, did you have that in you? I know you worked corporate jobs before, but like, how did you just make that switch? Yeah, so I have been always that way. It's funny because that's actually kind of how my last job ended. I'm a CPA and I was the VP of finance and I did all the like accounting for this company, but I really enjoyed like the big picture stuff. And I really enjoyed that it was a marketing company because I got to participate in like brainstorming sessions and stuff like that. And then I also ended up taking over our project management team for a period of time. And but that's kind of how that one ended because it was like they needed somebody to just be an accountant. And I was like, well, I'm not just an accountant. I have so much more to offer and there's so much more I want to do. And for Rob, Rob actually had another business 
when yeah. we first moved to Oklahoma City in 2005, you did that for how long? Like yeah, five years? Painting, yeah, you had a paint and body shop for uh, about five years. I worked on cars and it just wasn't, uh, <laughs> wasn't as successful, you know, as Bison is. It was a tough one. But that being said, right as it started to kind of gain traction, that was 09 is when the you know, everything tanked and I lost all my dealer accounts that paid the bills. And it was like, okay, we got to do something different. So I went back to car dealerships at that point. Yeah. And we make a really good team. Like we're like the yin and yang, right? So like, as far as business goes, we very much make a really good team. And with during that time when he had that business, I wasn't able to help at all. I was working on my master's and we had just had a baby. And so there was a lot of stuff going on. So yeah. I was left unattended with a business. They should never do that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So it sounds like you guys had it in you and you got your feet wet, Robert, with that first one. And uh, how great that you could start Bison. So let's dive into these details. What inspired you to start Bison Track, this motorcycle safety gear business in the first place? Well, I'm a motorcycle racer. Obviously, I have a passion for the gear side of it, for whatever reason. So I played hockey for 20 years. I was a goalie, and I always was excited about my equipment. Like, I just thought, I was always looking at, like, what's my next, you know, what are my next pads going to look like? What's my next helmet going to be painted like? You know, I was also always excited about that. And when I stopped playing hockey, I kept getting hurt playing hockey. So um, I stopped, and then I needed an outlet. And a year or two later, I started riding motorcycles, uh, much to her chagrin. And so I, that was my new outlet. And I realized, oh, shoot, like, yeah, all the gear and motorcycle gear is cool, too. You know, like all these helmets and all these jackets and gloves and boots. And so I ended up like just buying a bunch of used stuff. I had a basement full of things. If my friends crashed, you know, in their gloves or their helmet, they say, well, this is trash. I'd say, well, let me have it. I want to see if I can fix it or take it apart and see how it's made. And just like, I don't know, for whatever reason. I And then um, and plus, I have a creative side. You know, I, I have a creative mind. I love Right now, I'm working on some artwork for one of our racers for next season. And like, that's that's like a game to me. You know, all the numbers and the business stuff is tough. Like, it's a grind. But when I can sit down and like design something with somebody, that's where I get excited. So um, as a racer, I started to get sponsors. And I needed to have like a uniform look for, for my motorcycle paint, and my suit and everything. And that can get expensive. So I found a kind of a cheap outlet, you know. Normally, motorcycle suits about fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars, and I found a like a four hundred and fifty dollar outlet for these you know, custom motorcycle suit. I was like, nah, what's the worst that can happen? If it's junk, I'll just hang it on the wall and I'll buy something else. Well, I got it and it looked really good, but I could feel that it wasn't great quality. But I was so excited about wearing it, I just I raced in it and I took it to the track and all my friends were like, I can't believe you're going to race in that. I said, Yeah, but. It'll be fine. I'm on a little bike this weekend. You know, I'm not going to be going fast. Well, three laps into the race with this new suit, I crashed and uh, it it like dinged me up. I was bruised and, you know, the suit tore where it shouldn't have even torn. And, you know, I had, I had bruises because the padding wasn't good. And I said, OK, why isn't there an option for a custom suit? Like all of them are very expensive, but I see what this four hundred and fifty dollar suit is. And it's a starting point. Why can't there be something around it like a thousand bucks? You know, that's for racers, that's still a well-built thing, but it doesn't break the bank. And there were some options out there, but then on the flip side, the customer service was horrible. You know, the turnaround time was bad and it was just it's like, okay, I have really good customer service skills. If I could find somebody to make these things the way that I want them to be made and spec the way that I wanted to, and we can meet the price point, that would be pretty cool. Well, I happened to have a friend that was in the industry and he was kind of soured by one of our competitors. And he said, Hey, I, if you want to do this, I just give you my black book that has all the suppliers and everything, you know, and you can kind of get your foot in the door. You can make a bunch of phone calls. And I said, okay. So I was doing that kind of talking at the racetrack. And then Tasha came to me one day and she's like, Hey, this racing stuff's expensive. You know, <laughs> be nice if we could like make a buck and maybe have write some of this stuff off, you know, taxes wise. And I'm like, yeah, well, I've already kind of got an idea actually. And she's like, all right, well, we started chatting and then, um, Next thing you knew, we went down to Dallas for like the International Motorcycle Show. We met with some suppliers. We had some meetings and making phone calls. And then boom, we just we started making stuff. And I, of course, wore the first prototype stuff for a season, crashed it, made sure it was safe, you know, made some tweaks. And then 
at the end of the year, I told my friends at the last race of the season, I said, okay, guys, see this bison suit that I'm wearing. This is my company. And I want you guys to wear this stuff next year. And they were all in, you know, well-known name brand expensive suits. And they're like, really? Like you want us to wear your, and I'm like, no, just trust me. You guys saw it worked, right? It... And they're like, okay. So I got about five of our closest friends to buy the first run and they looked great. They performed great. And then all of a sudden that was down in Texas is where I raced primarily. And all of a sudden, boom, Texas just blew up. It was bison everywhere. That first year, just in that paddock of that one race club, all of a sudden we were like overwhelmed, her and I. And that's where we said we might need to do something different. Wow. Yeah. You found this personal need mm -hmm. to find something that has good quality, kind of custom and at a great price point. And gosh, with your connections and everything, it all worked out. Fell that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you guys. So curious why the name Bison Track? Yeah. yeah so, well, we're from Kansas, but we were living in Oklahoma City for about 15 years before we went full time. And I believe it's a state animal, right? The bison? I, I'm pretty sure it is. I think so. Um, and we're, <laughs> we should know this. We should know this. I always <laughs> say it is. I'm pretty sure it is. We were also big Oklahoma City Thunder basketball fans. We actually had season tickets for about eight years with them. Kansas. Oh, Kansas. We should, re I feel really terrible now. That's our home state, and we didn't know it was the home animal. Bison. <laughs> All right. So between that and the basketball team, the mascot for the basketball team was Rumble the Bison. And in Oklahoma City, there are bison. And this is probably why I think it's Oklahoma, because in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. there are bison all over the city, like yeah. statues of bison. They're, some of them are painted. Some of them are not painted, but they're all over. So that and then just like it just works with like the leather and the like needing to be tough, you know, it just kind of worked. And yeah, we wanted the name to speak to our roots as well, you know, hence the, you know. When you think of bison, you think of like the Midwest, you think of Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, you know, quarter, at least I do. You think of like a tough, badass American animal, you know, and you think of leather. And so we had gone through a whole bunch of different name options. And it's like naming a baby. You know, you go through all these things. It's like, I don't know. And then one day I was driving actually on the highway and I saw bison in the concrete on the walls. And I was like, bison, bison is a cool name. So I like texted her and said, hey, bison. And she's like, that's it. You know, it was just, it's like when you had that baby name that you, yeah. so. Yep. And we actually tried to register just bison, but yeah. again, being that it's so popular in the area, that was not available. So we added the track because it spoke to our roots at the racetrack. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And we've kind of dropped the track. From our branding. The from track a branding well. standpoint, we it was originally like on all our logos and everything, but we've kind of dropped it because. We do have future plans for stuff outside of the track, you know, street gear and whatnot. And we do have some now. Are you ready to elevate your RVing adventures? With RV Life Pro, you're not just getting a service. You're gaining a reliable companion for your journey. From planning your trips with precision to navigating with confidence and even connecting with a vibrant community of fellow RV enthusiasts, RV Life Pro is your all-in-one solution. Don't just dream about the perfect adventure, live it. Visit rvlife.com today and discover how RV Life can enhance your RVing experience. Yeah, so talk about this gear a little bit more. You said it's custom and that price point is great. Are there any other innovative features or design elements that are incorporated uh, that kind of sets it apart more from traditional products? Yeah, so as a racer, when it kind of set out to spec this stuff, of course, there are certain things that you want to see in a suit for, for like racing purposes, just like car racing, auto racing, you know, what happens on the NASCAR track, that technology filters down to the brake pads on your, you know, Chevy Equinox in your driveway, like that, that stuff all trickles down. And so that's why we started with racing. First of all, we knew that if the product worked well in racing, it was going to work well on the street. You know, if you're sliding down the track at 170 miles an hour, it's going to work at 30, 50 miles an hour. So anyway, we spec the products with certain materials, you know, certain construction methods. And what we have done to kind of set ourselves apart is we've tried to stay kind of ahead of the game, ahead of trends. For instance, right now, we just announced, well, last year, an integrated air vest 
in our race suits. Now, that's not new technology in and of itself, but we were working with Helite, which is a French company that is one of the pioneers of motorcycle air vests. And we were working with them to integrate this into our suits, you know, and that had been ongoing for like three years, that discussion, you know, and that back and forth. And so finally, we got the products this year. We've been putting them in the suits and it's giving people another option that they didn't have before, you know, and, and they're very excited about it. So it's, you know, things like that, kind of looking ahead. Right now, the thing that we're looking a lot at is alternative materials, you know, aside from leather. So we do have a vegan suit, which is constructed from Cordura and Superfabric in lieu of cowhide kangaroo stingray skin, which is what is used on our on all race suits right now. So that's a great product, but it's not certified for racing. And so what we're trying to do is find materials that will, you know, take up that gap between the vegan suit and the leathers so that we can certify a vegan suit for racing. And that's still down the road. We're talking to multiple companies. We've got some sample materials and working through some things, but it's definitely on our radar. Coming from the automotive industry, I've seen leather seats in cars go from animal leather to synthetic leather and even like recycled materials, you know, I like leather seats made out of plastic bottles, you know, it's like, and you couldn't tell the difference, wow. you know, crazy stuff like yeah. that. And the trick with motorcycle gear, obviously, is that it has to be not just durable for you to slide your butt in and out of every day, but to slide across the asphalt at 100 miles an hour. And so those tests and those certifications are are tricky. And uh, we're working at that. But those are the type of things that we look at, right? Right. No, good luck with that. Well, I hope you will find something that bridges that gap. Thank you. I think yeah. you will. So in that first year, your business was doing well, and it was starting to pick up. This is while you were still working the corporate jobs. At what point then did you decide you needed to travel instead of staying stationary? Yeah, so we had we had kind of a sit down strategy session about just who we were, what we wanted to accomplish and how we were going to accomplish it. We knew that, you know, with with what we were already doing in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, we could only grow so much, you know, and it was good, but there's so much more of the country that, you know, we were starting to see people pick up on it just by, because they knew somebody and people were asking us all the time, Hey, when are you going to come up here to Wisconsin? Or when are you going to come out to California? And part of the trick too, about what we do is like, we've said, everything's custom, the design's custom, which that's easy to do virtually. The measurements are custom. That's the trickier one. So we take 32 measurements and taking those in person is super easy. And Rob and I have got it down to, you know, a science where we can do it in like 10 or 15 minutes. But doing those virtually wasn't even like a thought, right? So we were focused on getting to as many people as we could. And we were like, well, we can do that. We can travel and do that. And we can you know, that can be the next phase of the business is growing geographically because we had considered, okay, we're at the point where we've kind of, I don't want to say tapped out in Texas, but definitely gotten a big market share in Texas. And so we were like, do we start releasing street gear? Like, where do we go from here? What's the next phase? And it was just, we felt like the right move was to grow geographically and get because we hadn't even touched, you know, California, which is turning out to be just as big and will eventually be bigger than Texas, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's why we went on the road. That's awesome. A lot of people buy from us. Well, and we have a lot of pro riders even that go with us just because we're there and they, they see us, they meet us and they're like, wow, this is a nice rig you have. You guys must be banking, you know, and it's like, nope, this is actually our house. And we sold everything to do this. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm totally buying from you. Like, <laughs> it's that whole people don't buy yeah. like what you do is why you do it. You know, whatever. Yes. People see that and they feel that they're like, man, you drove all the way out here from Kansas for this. They're like, yeah, we are on the road all the time. This is our passion. And they're like, yeah, OK. We get put a face with the company like that. People ask us all the time, like, how long have you guys worked for Bison? Like, how does this work? Are you a franchise or whatever? I'm like, no, we started the company. And they're like, wait, what? They think we're just popping up, you know, as a representative and they find out we own it right. and then they just like they buy right there. So that's been a big part of our growth, you know. 
Yeah, that personal touch, being in person, they get to see you, know your story, know you, Mm -hmm. they trust you. Yeah, you're right there. You can listen to their needs and it's custom. How perfect. That's awesome. So my other big question here is how do you handle all these physical products in your RV? Where do you put it all? How much do you carry with you? That's tricky, I'm sure. It is. Yeah, Yeah, it's been a process. We actually, the when we very first went on the road, we had our first couple shipments shipped to an RV park or a racetrack. And we realized quickly that it was not going to, that was not going to be sustainable. And this was when we were getting, you know, maybe five suits at a time. Yeah. So thankfully, my mom, she didn't have like a full-time employment. She's always just raised us and, you know helped around the house, took care of my grandparents and my niece. And I was like, Hey, would you like to maybe be the point of contact for us? Like if we have everything shipped to your house, cause you're always there, they don't travel. They don't get out and do a lot. Would you like to be the point of contact? She was like, sure. I mean, you know, could use extra money and why not? And that's really evolved. That was, I guess, almost five years now. It'll be yeah. five years, I believe in early February. But now she is our full on shipping and receiving quality control. Inventory management. Inventory management. Yeah. And now that we have a space, you know, she has where she can actually organize everything. We actually were doing everything out of my parents' house for the first like four years. Mm -hmm. And it started as, hey, can we rent this room, this extra bedroom that you empty nesters have available? to whoops uh now we're gonna have to start putting stuff in this other room and then it's a good problem (laughs) yeah last year at christmas was actually kind of a turning point as well because last year at christmas we were sitting in their living room trying to have a conversation and we were like looking over boxes and (laughs) we were closer together because they had to move their furniture out from the wall because the whole wall was lined with boxes and it had just gotten out of control they were fine they were like no it's fine we've got more space in the shed and we have this and we were both like no we need it organized and everything in one space Mm -hmm. and so we've made that move this year so now what do you do well, it actually worked out perfectly because my brother owns a couple of businesses and he was looking at buying a shop right down the road. Well, he was looking all over the place, but he ended up finding a shop, what, two miles yep. from my parents' house and his house. And he's like, I don't need all this space. He's like, so if you guys want to commit to it, I'll go ahead and get it. And then then you can rent space from us so now it's nice because i'm like i'd rather you give you our rent money than some random person you know and it's Mm -hmm. it's become this kind of like family family (laughs) yeah yeah because my parents are there Mm -hmm. and um, my niece helps my brother out now and it's yeah it's just kind of like a family the kids are there because they're Mm -hmm. homeschooling and yeah it's fun that's wonderful so everything gets shipped this is in kansas yes Uh Okay, so everything gets shipped there, but then how do you guys get it if you're on the road? Like, what's the logistics of all that? Yeah, so for the most part, my mom just fulfills orders direct to the customers from here. Oh, she, okay. She gets like a, a large shipment of like 10 suits, takes everything out, QCs it, repackages it nicely, you know, because who knows what customs did to it or whatever. So repackages everything nicely and branded and, and then ships it mm-hmm. out directly to the customers. We do have instances, like if we're coming up on a big event or something where, you know, especially the first race of the season, everyone waits till the last minute. Everyone needs their stuff like drop ship to the track. So we'll have like a huge shipment come in to the racetrack where we just kind of have to coordinate. We've kind of figured out the timing. And as long as nothing crazy happens in customs, (laughs) then, then we're good, but we'll get it there. We'll take out everything and QC it and ship it out from there. Daytona in March is always our big one because that's the first event of the year. And it, it's the Daytona 200. They're at the big racetrack. All the teams have to look their best and everything. And so ultimately we have the Daytona shipping and receiving guys know like they will have a pallet. 
you know, actually we have a picture from last year where we're taking a pallet jack just stacked with stuff out of there and loading it into our RV. And then as I'm driving down the road, her and Carter are unboxing stuff and there's just pit shirts and suits and gloves and everything <laughs> all over the RV. And then we get there and people are knocking on the door. Hey, you got my stuff? You got my stuff? And we're giving them out. And then we're jumping on the motorcycle and running around trying to deliver it to people, figure out where everybody's at. It is chaos. <laughs> It's crazy. That is chaos. So, oh my goodness. Sometimes it goes really well and sometimes it does not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've had both. I can imagine. Yeah. So you guys mainly you're going out in your RV doing this and you're taking your hands on with the measurements and you're meeting them mm -hmm. and you're making the sale and all that stuff. That's the majority of your, you know, with the RV. And then they receive them from your point of sale in yeah, in Kansas. I got that. Yeah, now. for the most part. Well, I forgot to mention, we do carry inventory with us as well. So we will, okay. we will pull out, you know, five of these or 10 of these or whatever. And in the outlaw, it was really, really good. Like we had the back garage area that was pretty much full of our canopy, our flags, our, all of our inventory, all those things. So that worked out really well. We're still trying to figure out what our new situation is going to be in the new RV because we're probably going to have to get like a trailer and, and go that route. Yeah. So pretty much all yeah. under the basement storage in this new RV is bison stuff. <laughs> wow. so, and there's a lot of space, but we don't have a garage anymore that we had in outlaw. So we're trying to figure that out. What do you have right now then? So we actually bought a 98 Fleetwood American tradition class A pusher. It's really, really nice. And Ironically, the family that had it before us full timed in it for six years. So uh, the interior is beautiful. It has custom made bunks, you know, bunk beds, which are great for Edie and Carter mm -hmm. and the rabbit. And <laughs> it actually works out really well for us. The exterior looks terrible. It looks like Cousin Eddie's RV. Uh, it has a bunch of delamination. The paint's falling off of it. Um, so <laughs> being a paint and body guy, oh, no. I will fix that at some point. But we got a great at deal on it. At some point. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. In his free time. I always like yeah, to say, free time. in your free time, because <laughs> mm -hmm. that doesn't exist when you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> so in that first year or two being on the road, you experienced a lot of growth, correct? Yeah. 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 That's mm -hmm. awesome. So how are you running such a, it seemed, large business now from the road, like typical in-person they usually have all these meetings and like all these things. Like, how do you keep track of everything? How do you do it? Yeah. So we have a team that we work with now. That's how much we've grown. You know, it's not just my mom. We actually have somebody in, in Georgia. We have somebody in Oklahoma. We have somebody in California. So we meet every Monday. We have a standing Monday meeting where we meet with the team. Um, we do it all virtually. We can from anywhere, you know. We use Google Meet. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, just then we meet with people on the road at the track. We do a lot of that where mm -hmm. we'll we'll measure them. We'll talk to them about the gear, you know, so. Yeah, WhatsApp and Google Meets has been our friend for sure. So, and then Starlink, it was kind of a game changer for us. So, yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah, we could pretty much do everything we needed to from like our phone hotspot prior to Starlink, except Rob's big on like YouTube videos and you know, so the big stuff where we needed to download a lot of or upload a lot of data, that's where the Starlink really was a game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You guys have a YouTube channel as well. Yes. Yep. Lackeys be tripping. Nice. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's your personal brand. Lackeys yeah. be tripping. I love it. <laughs> yep. How did that name come to be? Actually, I worked for a marketing company and I kind of threw it out there one day. I don't know if it was in a group setting or in a meeting or something, but one of the girls that I worked with, she was our creative director. She was like, Lackey's be trip," and she just threw it out there. And I was like, yep, that's it. And mm -hmm. then another one of the people I worked with, a designer, he's the one that created the logo and each of the little characters. And now he's helped us with some bison stuff as well. So, Oh, that's great. So can you guys kind of go over what a typical day kind of looks like for you guys on the road and then also walk us through like when you go trackside and how do you promote it and all that stuff? Yeah. So it's kind of funny. A typical day for us could be, I, I don't know. It's, right. <laughs> uh, it goes back to that freedom and flexibility thing uh, for mm -hmm. me. We're, you know, we kind of adapt and we have to because of the amount of travel that we do. So let's look at a week. 
during the heat of the race season, I always tell people uh, we were at a different racetrack for six weeks or seven weeks straight. Seven. A different racetrack for seven different weeks every single weekend mm-hmm. in a different state. Every single one was in a different state. So what that means is we roll in like Wednesday night to Thursday. We get set up, set all our canopy, our inventory and everything up. And then we bust our humps Friday, Saturday, Sunday, tear down Sunday and maybe leave Sunday night. If the track will let us stay, we'll stay over till Monday morning. And then we jump on the computers, try to knock some stuff out. And then I jump behind the wheel and we take off. Wow. Then, you know, we've got two days of travel to get to the next track by Wednesday night to get in there, to get set up Thursday, to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we did that for seven weeks straight. And you want to talk about a burnout? That was, that was tough. Yeah, that was so, yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah, that was a couple years ago. We scaled that back last year. We we learned a lesson there. We said we can't do that. We can't go that hard. So um, mm-hmm. still, it's very intense travel schedule. And so for us, like every day during that week is different, you know? Monday morning, we'll wake up, we'll try to jump out of the racetrack before they shut the gates on us or, you know, or whatever. We'll get out of the track, go find a truck stop or something, set the computers up, get on our Monday meeting with our team, do all that. And then I start driving early afternoon. I primarily do most of the driving. Tasha, because she does a lot of the computer, you know, the numbers and the, a lot of the logistical stuff internally, she's on the computer. And then she also, we might talk about this too, she has a consulting company that she starts. Mm-hmm. So she now has some clients with that. That keeps her really busy. So I just drive, drive, drive as hard and fast as I can. And then I stop. I get on my computer and uh, we do get a lot of Planet Fitnesses um, for showers because we're boondocking a lot. So, you yeah. know, Planet good Fitness ideas. are typically, you get it. They're usually in yep. good areas. So you can stop, mm-hmm. not worry about it, go and work out, get a shower, you know, maybe use their Wi-Fi. <laughs> Except in Portland. Don't stop at the Planet Fitness along the highway in Portland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a few Do of noted. them that will. <laughs> well, the thing we found in the Pacific Northwest is they uh, they don't want you to stop very long because there's so many people mm. just squatting in RVs. So, oh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. literally, and it was in a nice area, but we stopped, went in, worked out, came back out and just started making dinner. And there's a security guard like, hey, you guys need to go. Like, you can't stop. And I'm like, oh, Yikes. Jesus. So that was tricky up in the P&W. But uh, anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what our week looks like, right? So we're just mm-hmm. go, go, go. Now, when we settle in and we're able to take some time, we don't plan ahead landmarks, but we try to, like we stumbled upon Mount St. Helens, right? We're like, oh, Mount St. Helens is right over there. Let's just go over there. And so we spent a day and we just told our team, hey, we're going to be offline today. And we drove up and we hit all the the exploration spots and the kids got on-site learning that day. We found Independence Rock in the middle of nowhere, Mm -hmm. climbed up there and saw (laughs) the engravings, you know, from the settlers and stuff, things like that. We just kind of do impromptu. We try to slow down a little bit, and that's what we're going to try to do even more next year. Yeah, we're bad at planning, but (laughs) the good news is we kind of can be because of the way we travel. So Mm -hmm. we're never looking for, I say never, rarely looking for RV parks for the weekend Yeah, because we're always at a racetrack. So usually if we're looking for an RV park, it's for like Monday through Thursday at the latest. So that's never really been an issue. We can just pull um, in there usually, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got a spot. You know? Yeah. So, unless it, you're in Florida. Yeah, <laughs> especially this time of year in Florida. This but, time of year, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so the way we travel, it, it works out that we're not planners. <laughs> and I say that we have to kind of we do plan, plan our events and stuff, but yeah, we've also right. been known to kind of have some options or not <laughs> have had something on our radar, and then we add it. So, yeah, we're flexible. Yeah, you're flexible. You have your anchors, though. So that helps For a lot because sure. you know yeah. you have to be somewhere. You're going to be there and you can boondock. Yeah. You guys are good at that now. You travel a lot and you have this business that you're doing. So, how do you handle all the legal aspects of selling a product from the road in different states? I assume now your business is actually started in Kansas. So, maybe that's how you're, you're dealing with that. But go ahead. Yeah, so it actually started in Oklahoma, and we're registered in Oklahoma, which is still okay. Uh, We have two kids in school in Oklahoma, so that's also a thing. But it's interesting. So most of our sales are online or at a track. So most states, for sales tax purposes, have like a small business exception. So if you only sell... X number of dollars in a certain state, you don't have to collect and 
remit sales tax. But once you get to a certain point, you do. And you might remember this change. It's probably been eight years now when Amazon started charging sales tax on things. They used to not. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. Because it used to be all about your physical location. And then there was a shift that happened where it's like if you're doing a certain amount of business in a state, you know, Mm -hmm. now there's that part of it. So we have to collect sales tax in Oklahoma because that's where we're registered. It's just kind of our home base. You know, that's where we collect sales tax. And then there's Kansas, which happens to be the only state in the country that does not have a small business exception. So if you sell $5, I mean, that's, you know, a little dramatic, but basically if you sell $5 in Kansas, you have to register to be a business and collect sales tax in Kansas. And then every other state right now, you know, we're just not at that point. You know, it's six Mm -hmm. figures plus in each state that you have to sell to make it. I think we're probably getting close on a couple of states, but, you know, that'll be something we deal with as as we continue to grow. But yeah, as far as the legalities and stuff, there's not a lot there. It's really just more around taxes. Yeah, I was going to ask you, being a CPA, do you handle all of your taxes for the business or do you outsource that? So. I hate taxes. <laughs> I yeah. have never yeah. done taxes. I, I can't say I've never done them. I've always, I've never done them professionally. I never went the tax route. Um, I did auditing for a while and I've done like mainly just been in industry working for companies. We outsource our taxes and we've gone through a couple different firms, mainly because I know enough to like be annoying to some CPA firms Yep, where I catch them on things but I don't want to do it. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't Understood. do the taxes, but I, I know enough to make sure the books are right and, you know, they have what they need and we can make tax decisions. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Taxes is just one of those things, like, unless you do it all day, every day, you're not going to be really proficient On the ball. in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there's so many tax law changes every year. It changes. And, yeah. You sure. just can't stay up on it. So. Mm -mm, Good call. So what percentage of your traveling are you able to realistically have covered by bison and expense on your business taxes? Do you know? Yeah. So (laughs) I would love for you to answer this question. No, No, um, I have no idea. (laughs) Or you don't have to. If it's too personal, (laughs) you don't have to. I'm conservative, but, and I get a lot of flack for that from people, but what people don't understand is because I'm a CPA, I can't be like, well, I didn't know that because literally I have a license and I take CPE credits every year. Like it's my job to know, you know? So I don't have the luxury of just being able to say, well, I didn't know I couldn't take that much, you know? So I'm probably more conservative. I know I'm more conservative than most people, but the way we've done it up until this point is we do it all based on mileage. So if we leave Kansas, we drive to a track in Atlanta, I figure out how many miles that was, take a miles deduction, and then we do a per diem for the the days of the event. Because we live in our RV, it's really tricky because we can't write off 100% of our RV. So, Mm -hmm. you know, with taxes, you either have to do mileage or actual costs, and we can't do 100%. So the Mm -hmm. easiest thing for me to like, show, hey, we went here, we were here for X number of days, is just to do mileage and a per diem system. Mm-hmm. So I would say probably, I mean, it's depending on how much we travel. So there's certain times of the year, it's more than others. But I would mm-hmm. say overall, it's probably maybe 60%, 50 to okay. 60% of mm-hmm. our travel costs we write off. That's decent. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it could be more, but yeah, <laughs> it can't be 100%. <laughs> It can't. Live You're in living RV. in it. That's right. So it's personal. Too. No, we did. Do we want to tell her about the potential resale? Yes. Of the RV. So. So we oh, are yeah. kind of making a transition there this year. Mm-hmm. We actually bought our new RV under another business where we're going to oh, just like a house, fix it up. We bought one mm-hmm. that needs some work. We're going to fix it up and like sell it within the next probably two years. And okay. the idea is to you know flip it, make some money and Mm -hmm. write it off fully in the meantime. So it's a little, it's viewed differently because we are, we did buy it as an investment. Like we know Mm -hmm. it needs work and, you know, so 
it's a little different with the new RV, but yeah. Oh, well, that's good. We got a new one, you know, paid a fraction of the yeah. price for this one as our other one was. Right. You know, we got to put some blood, sweat, and tears into it, but mm -hmm. I enjoy doing that anyway. And then at the end, we'll have a nice RV that somebody can enjoy and, and make then we'll money. And hopefully be able to stair step up actually yeah. to the RV we <laughs> right. really need. Right. <laughs> yeah. Searching for the perfect campground can be overwhelming, but not with RV Life Campgrounds. With user-generated reviews, RV-specific data, and real-world internet speed tests, you'll have all the information you need to find your ideal spot. Don't leave your camping experience to chance. Trust the experts at RV Life. Visit campgrounds.rvlife.com to start your search. But my goodness, you guys have so much going on, <laughs> and you have some other little small businesses going on as yeah. well there, Tasha. Oh my gosh. So how do you balance... Are you just go, 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 go? You just never stop? Or how do you balance this work life and then homeschooling? You've got kids. Yeah. So thankfully, we have a really good homeschooling structure. It's less homeschooling. It's more just kind Road of keep schooling, track life of schooling. making sure. Yeah, it's they, an online so, charter. Yeah, they have yeah. a teacher okay. and a curriculum and all that. So I'm pretty oh, hands perfect. off on that, especially now that they're older. And Rob was doing most of that I don't have the patience for school to be honest. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> Rob was doing most of that in the beginning. With, with Edith in the beginning, it was tough because she couldn't even fully read yet. You know, yeah. so it yeah. was like you have to sit down with her and walk her, read things to her. And, yeah. But sorry, I just went on where we were. Yeah, the balance. Oh yeah, yeah. the balance <laughs> thing. Yeah, I'm bad at it. I, but it's and so I so bad. <laughs> So I actually get annoyed because I feel like there's been this whole big push for like work-life balance and that's fine and I get it and I understand that it's necessary. But at the same time, some people enjoy working and some people enjoy like get their, like for me personally, I'm fulfilled by the work that I do, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah. that kind of flows over to personal satisfaction too now okay right now it's a little crazy and i would love nothing more than to get to the gym because i was in a really good routine on that and now i'm not but yeah it's it's hard and it's funny because we started this <laughs> with the idea of like let's spend more time together and do more things and travel and with it being an entrepreneur that's really hard depending on your business right. depending on your business like we're in hyper growth mode yeah you know, we're juggling a lot of things. So for us, it's really hard. We've actually, I wouldn't say necessarily done as much as we'd like to do. But at the same time, we spend every day with our kids, you know? Yeah. So yep. it's kind of that trade off of like, yeah, we may not be going to do like all this fun sightseeing stuff that you see all these other full time mm -hmm. families do. But but my kid is sitting next to me every day and we have little conversations here. So it's more about those moments than the big yes. things. Yeah. Yes. It's that quality time together and and they're experiencing real life, you know, yep. the life skills that it takes to run a small business, especially on the road. But yeah, you get to you get to travel and see and experience all kinds of people as well. They're sponges. I'm sure they're taking in a lot of that. Oh, yeah. And and like you said, down the road, it might, you know you're in that super growth phase. So I think you'll have a shift where you can kind of breathe a little and be like, okay, <laughs> I can, yeah. I can do something a little bit here that I wanted to do or, or that. So yep. yeah. very that's good. Been the whole goal with how we've structured bison is mm -hmm. we've to a point over invested in the people that we have on our team, because we're trying to get to a point where, and we are in a lot yeah. of ways at a point where the business we always say the business will run itself without us. It doesn't need us mm -hmm. for in order to come in and things to go out. We have systems right. and processes and people set up, mm -hmm. but yeah. for it to grow and continue to grow, it still needs us. And yeah. we're working yeah. on that now. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. You need to be there. You need to be that face. But in the future, do you feel like someone else could be there track side working for you, taking those measurements? Yeah. We've actually just started a new program this year. where. We're trying to clone ourselves because now that we've been to all 48 states as of last year, we've been to all four corners, the Southern California, Arizona, that was our last frontier. We got down there and they're like, cool. So we spent the winter down there last year. 
because they race in the desert in the wintertime. And so mm-hmm. we stayed down there and it kept work going. And we wanted to do that again this year, but we have the new RV and there's still things going on. We have a sprinter van as well that we haven't even talked about. The engine blew oh on that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So we blew the sprinter engine at the end of last season. And so we just are getting that fixed. And anyway, mm-hmm. we couldn't make it down to California. So everybody's like, where are you guys at? There's this event last weekend. And they're like, you guys are, we, we put some stuff into the raffle and everything. They're like, hey, we saw the, the vice and suit in the raffle. Are you guys coming? And we're like, no, we're, we can't get out there. And so oh, no. what we have then is we're trying to get people in different areas that can be us, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. And so we've created this cool structure for trackside partners is what we're calling them. They'll get a canopy and flags and stuff just as we do, but they buy mm-hmm. their inventory and sell it. Then they make their margin on it. And uh, then they can also take measurements and everything. So kind of like a, a hybrid structure. franchise model. Mm-hmm. It's not a franchise, mm-hmm. but it kind of yeah. acts as one. Mm-hmm. But we're really, really protective of our brand and our culture because yes. that is what we're known for. Yep. And so right. mm-hmm. we don't want to fully let go mm-hmm. with the franchise model. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of a hybrid. Yeah. So with that culture and that community, is it's very important, like in the RV world. I can imagine it's very important in the motorcycle world. And so have you guys incorporated anything else like built that kind of community of these safety conscious riders within Bison Track? Yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. when we started this company, we really wanted it to be a lifestyle brand at some point. You know, we look at brands like Nike or, uh, you know, people, people wear Alpine Stars as one of our big competitors. They're one of the, like I'd say, big three, right? And people wear Mm -hmm. Alpine Stars hats. They've never been on a motorcycle before. Or a race car or anything, you know, they just, it's a brand thing or Fox, Fox racing. You see teenage girls with big Fox racing sticker on their car and never on a motorcycle. And so we want Bison (laughs) to be that way. And what kind of happened organically, and it took us a little bit by surprise, was this thing kind of happened. We call it the herd. And uh, Mm. the herd is just our, it it can be our customer base, but could also be just people that are fans of the brand. And so it's evolving Mm -hmm. into this lifestyle thing. We go to events all over. Well, all over the world, even people will send us a picture of somebody at a race in Europe that wearing a bison shirt, you know, and they're like, look, look at this guy's wearing a bison shirt. I'm like, that's ah, awesome. They're on the other side of the world. Right. And so it's it's become this thing where it's like you don't even have to wear our gear to be part of the herd. You just got to be kind of a fan, you know, mm-hmm. and um, we hear this constantly from our returned customers and even new customers that they just want to be a part of it. Uh, we have a writer in South Korea that applied for sponsorship this year. And he said, I feel like I'm part of a family, even though I'm on the other side of the planet. It's just really cool uh, being part of the herd, you know? Mm-hmm. So That's the circle's awesome. tight to your point. Yes. It's great that we have that community. We've built that just kind of organically, but we can't take our foot off the accelerator. We can't change things because the second you mess up and social media has tightened that circle, as you know, the second yeah. you mess up, that then becomes your reputation. And mm-hmm. so trying to maintain that really good customer service, as Tasha said, being really protective of our brand and our culture. Right. We've had some, as an example, some really fast riders, you know, racers with very good resumes that we've turned away for sponsorships because we have seen or heard things in the paddock that don't align with our culture and that we don't want to associate our brand with. And so it can mm-hmm. be difficult as a small business to do that because you mm-hmm. see somebody come to you with a big name and you're like, yeah, okay. We just need to do it, right? No, but it's long term. It you know, it's it's a short sighted vision. So the circle's tight. One thing we're trying to do is influence people that are riding on the street and uh, stunt riders, for instance. Gear is uncool to them. Like it's just stunt riders, yeah. especially those are the people that crash the most, and they wear t-shirts, maybe a helmet, but t-shirts, no gloves. You know, and I, I just see them crash yeah. all the time, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, they think it's cool to Ugh. crash themselves up, but like, well, let's make your gear cool where you'll wear it a little, at least a little bit of it, and. <laughs> Anyway, we're just trying to operate intentionally with everything we do and those intentions being good and pure and not losing sight of mm-hmm. our culture. So, yeah, and I think that's going to be the hardest thing as we grow. And we know that's going to be the hardest thing is like, how do we create this bigger company that allows us to do more things and support more writers, but still maintain our same level of customer service and our culture? And so that's yeah. really our big focus this year. And honestly, with the trackside partner thing, we we had this vision like a year ago where we 
we knew we needed to do it a year ago and we talked about it. We're like, okay, we need to meet people. But part of our thing is we don't want to force it. We want to make sure that the person that we're bringing on is a good fit. And so until we have those people, we're just not going to do it. And, you know, so it's, it's delayed things a little bit there, but it's the right call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. You guys are doing the right thing. I like your purpose and your mission with all that. Yeah, it's fabulous. You. Yeah. So after four years, what have you guys, what have you all learned that you wish you knew when you started traveling? Uh, put a third dump valve on the waste tank outlet so it doesn't drip all over you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, it's, uh, Don't yeah. leave the cap inside the hose when you put two hoses together. <laughs> Make sure you take no, the plug out. nothing yeah. will come out. <laughs> yeah, no. In all seriousness, I think that um, there's a few takeaways. Tasha and I visited about this. We've talked about it a lot, actually, but I think the first thing would be maintenance and repair time and slash cost, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. for us traveling so much, especially when we bought our outlaw, we bought an extended warranty and that was great peace of mind. But honestly, mm -hmm. I made so many repairs myself just because we didn't have time to put it in the shop for three months. And, no. you know, it's just, I, I remember specifically the carburetor on our generator went out and we were in the middle of like Montana and traveling across the United States. And I said, I just got to go to Cummins and buy a $450 carburetor and put on this instead of paying our $100 deductible. I just mm -hmm. had to bite the bullet and do it. Yeah. It wasn't worth the time, yeah. Yeah. We just, we knew it was going to be a lot. We didn't have any illusion that this thing was just going to go down the road no. without issue. We've seen people no. that do have that illusion and we, yeah. we definitely Bad are news. Not, we're not yeah. those people, but. All of them. Good. All of them have issues and you know that. So that oh, yeah. was the one thing. It's like an earthquake yeah. going down the road every time you drive. Uh -huh. So everything yeah. gets shaken up. Yeah. Bingo. And then I think the other point of that kind of in conjunction would be that newer and shinier and more expensive does not equal better when it comes to RVs and motorhomes. Nope. Here mm -hmm. we are in this 98 and we have friends with 2020 RVs that they paid $200,000 for and they're just falling apart going down the road in this 98. Don't get me wrong has a lot of issues, but right. it's no more or no less than a brand new one. Mm -hmm. We had a 97 outdoors RV travel trailer and it uh -huh. was built like a tank. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, it was the best. Yeah, I wish I would have known that for sure when we started because I would have just gone this route from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard a lot of people say it in my research. You know, a lot of people mention that on Facebook and on the forums. And, and I mm -hmm. can see that just by looking at them. There are two problems that we had when we started. One was we thought we needed to have a toy hauler for sure. And that was why, you know, they don't make any older class A's that are toy haulers. So right. short of getting like a, a class eight, you know, semi conversion, that wasn't going <laughs> to happen. So yeah. um, we, we got the outlaw and the outlaw was great actually for what it was, but the older RVs also harder to get loans on. And I mm -hmm. just didn't know enough about them to go look at one and determine if it was a good or a bad one. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, now that I know them top to bottom, I went and looked at this one. I'm like, yep, looks like crap. Nobody else wants to drive it, but I know that the bones are good. That's all I care about. So that's important. Yeah. You know, I didn't have that education four years, five years ago. So yeah, mm -hmm. I say I wish, but I'm glad we have that experience to like yeah. bring us to this point. Yeah. Right. You don't really know unless you're in it and doing it. I mean, yeah. Yep. There's a big difference. You can research all you want, but yeah. <laughs> you just have to yes. do it. Well, and then just like how much stuff you pack too. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure you experienced this, but yes. I think we probably downsized our personal belongings like five times since we've been in here because yep. we were, you know, filled to the brim. We need everything. We need totes for this and that. And mm -mm. No, you can get yeah. a lot on the road too. I mean, you don't need everything. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, every time yeah. we come back to Oklahoma, which is where our storage unit is, we would be like, okay, let's make a trip to the storage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we know now that we don't need these three totes, you know. And nope. and honestly, we really just have clothes and our like electronics. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Like food yep. and. Yep. So yeah. That's all you need. You got your experiences out there. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Yeah. So looking back at your journey with Bison Track, is there anything you wish you'd known when you started that you'd like to share with other entrepreneurs? 
So I feel like, no. (laughs) And this is why, because I feel like so many entrepreneurs wait until everything is so perfect before they launch and they go. And it's like, it's never going to be perfect. So you need to just go. I would say every year we, we have a big learning moment, you know, or not moment. There's like a takeaway from every season. It's like one year it was, you know, we need to work on our fitment guarantee policy because we were, our fitment guarantees were kind of out of control and we didn't have a good written policy. You know, it's still something that's a big part of our business because it just is, that's the nature of our business. But um, we didn't have a good written policy that protected us and the customer. That was last year. We we wrote the policy and put it into play this year. And that mm-hmm. was really good. This year, it was like, <laughs> because of our vehicle issues and stuff, we didn't travel for the last half of the year. And that was a huge impact on our business, like sales-wise and financially. So now we know we need to really replicate ourselves. We have to move in that direction if we, because then if we're not traveling, we're not worried about sales because there's other people out there representing the brand. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like little stuff like that, that you learn. There's a moment or a takeaway every year or every phase of your business life cycle. Now, that being said, being a CPA, I had like the accounting stuff down and I could see how A lot of people jump into a business without thinking through that and without collecting the information they need and saving receipts and doing all the things. Like, I think that's probably the thing I would warn people about most is like, make sure you're, you have all your ducks in a row when you start, because if you don't, it's going to be a kind of a nightmare on the back end. Right. And people don't think about that. No, no, that's a tough part for a lot of people. And they try and take it on and they think they could do it, but either outsource or you better know what you're doing. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little like your future plans, I guess, for Bison Track, but anything else and and your RV adventures, anything up on the horizon here? Well, I mean, we're going to try to, as I said earlier, take it a little bit slower in terms of the business Mm -hmm. stuff and Mm -hmm. spend a little bit more time on the family. Our oldest son, well, not our oldest son, our oldest son that's with us. Uh, we have two kids mm-hmm. that are out of the house and they're older and they're in their 20s, married and all that. But Carter is 16 and we pulled in here in Kansas and parked the RV and he like took off to go live with my brother-in-law next door. Um, so, oh, wow. He needed some very, space. Yeah. He's yeah. very different than us too. He's like he very type mm-hmm. A and nobody else in the family is that way. So I am I know it's a lot for him. Like, yeah. Traveling. Yeah. But he's doing a great job with it. He's figured out ways to occupy himself and make money while he's on the road. He works for Moto America when we go to those events and stuff like that. But he got a full time job at Chick-fil-A here in Wichita, and he is loving that. And actually it's supposed to be part time. Well, yeah, it's part time. Now it's full time. (laughs) And today he's working 12 hour shift for actually 14 hour shift total today. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of what this kid's about. Mm -hmm. But. What I'm getting at there, we're probably only going to have one more year with him. Right? He's 16 and he's like, listen, yeah, he's fighting it. And I'm like, you are coming with us one more year. I think he's going to be gone next year. So we really want to do as much as we can while we have him on board still. Yeah, because not only is he working over 40 hours a week at 16, he is doubling up wow. on school and his plan is to graduate before the end of this year. So we unexpectedly wow. are approaching senior year already. Mm-hmm. In yes, you are. <laughs> so yeah, that's um, that was kind of a stressful moment for me. I'm like, wait, did I just take your last first day of school picture? <laughs> like, it made oh, me, yeah. it made me really sad. Yeah. But yeah, I think I wouldn't say we've talked him into. I think we've forced, we're forcing him one more year. We're like, look, yeah, you owe us one more year. You don't get to go. <laughs> just live yeah. your life yet. So it'll be fine once we're on the road. But we do have to do things to keep him. <laughs> occupied, you know, and, and like, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. We have a 13 year old and, mm-hmm. and we want to get back out on the road, like part-time for a little while and uh, trying to do that before he gets, you know, to that age, he's already like, he's into driving games and that stuff online and just wants to learn all about the rules of the road right now. I'm like, wow, this is early, but okay. Yeah. Part of our homeschool is do this. Yeah. You know, we, <laughs> yeah. we use life. Yeah. 
pretty cool. Yeah. So guys, anything else do you want to comment on? I know we talked a lot. This is a great long episode. This is awesome. But I want to give you one more opportunity. We do have our first international trip coming up. So Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, so do tell. It's just the two of us and it's it is a work related trip. It's something we kind of won because of what we're doing with our business. But uh we are supposed to be going to Thailand at the end of January. So Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like a, a week long. Yeah. Actually it's a motorcycle tour of Thailand. So we'll yeah. be on a motorcycle for about a week going through the whole country. So yeah, that'd be amazing. Awesome. <laughs> so that's cool. Yeah, that is very cool. A big thing, which we didn't mention before. I don't know if you've heard of the show, The Blocks. Uh, it's an entrepreneur show. It's no. on Prime Video. And then you can okay, get have it to on look that up. the app. Yeah, so it's B-L-O-X. And oh, so, okay, Blocks. Yeah. So The Blocks is, well, it's hard to explain, but basically they have lots of training content on their website, mm -hmm. on their app. And then they have this show that they do every year. and we got accepted into the next season of the blocks so we'll be shooting that at the end of february uh, there's a week in february we'll be shooting it and then it'll i don't know when it'll be when it'll air but something to keep yeah. an eye out for so go check out the blocks and watch for us on there yeah i don't know what season it's going to be even but this is the first time we've talked about it to anybody we haven't announced it on social or anything so you heard it oh wow first. exclusive first <laughs> exclusive yeah. that's awesome guys i am so excited for you all what is the best way for our listeners to follow or reach out to you guys online yeah so uh, we're on all i would say all the social it's not really all it's instagram facebook blackies be tripping youtube definitely on youtube mm -hmm. and you can email us. We also have a website. It's lackeysbetrippin.com with links mm -hmm. to all those social channels and mm -hmm. some blogs and whatnot. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And for Bison Track. Yeah. I was going to say Bison. Uh, so bisontrack.com or bisonleathers.com. Mm -hmm. And then okay. uh, on all the social channels, it's either Bison or Bison Track. Okay. You know, Instagram, Facebook. I think our Instagram is Bison underscore track. Yeah, some of them so, are weird because yeah, of you can find we'll find when you pick a name like Bison, it's kind of <laughs> yeah. Type in Bison yeah. motorcycle gear, and uh, boom, everything it. will pop up. Sure thing. I'll be sure to put all these links in the show notes for everyone. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to come on the show today. I know you all are super busy, but I really had a lot of fun chatting with you, and I wish you continued success in all your businesses and on the road, guys. Thank Same, you. Rose. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for having us. How exciting for Robert and Tasha. It is so inspiring to witness the dedication and the hard work that they're putting into growing their business bison. It's a phase of any venture that requires immense effort and a focused mindset. And it's evident that they are fully committed to steering their business towards success. And their entrepreneurial journey really resonates with me in the experiences that my husband and I had while growing our first stationary business and also currently with growing our blog at Reset Your Journey. The excitement, hard work, consistency, and the pursuit of those goals, all universal elements in any entrepreneurial journey. I want to give a massive thank you to Robert and Tasha for taking the time to share their journey with us, as they gave some wonderful insights and practical guidance and are a great source of motivation for those navigating the exciting yet demanding path of business growth. So if you're a motorcycle fan or interested in what they're doing with Bison and their unique adventures, definitely go check out their websites at bisontrack.com and lackeysbetrippin.com and on all their socials. You can find all their links in these show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I absolutely loved being here with you all. Please let us know what phase you're working on in your business and how it's going over on the RV Entrepreneur Facebook group. We'd love to hear from you. And for more insights to all sorts of RV lifestyle adventures and challenges, be sure to tune into our sister podcast, the RV Life Podcast. In fact, my husband and I were recent guests on the show back in December, discussing if you should start a YouTube channel. Hmm, what do you think? You can tune in over there to hear all about that. Have a great week. 